I am really excited to have uh, Joe Brown of Heresy Financial. Um, here you have a YouTube channel uh, by the same name, Heresy Financial. And you've, uh, I guess I've been, you, you know, you've basically been my go-to guy for kind of off the mainstream um, media information related to financial stuff. And I guess I've been following you for a couple of years. How long have you been doing the podcast? Uh, just, just over two years. So yeah, if you've been a couple of years, then you've been around since the beginning. Okay. Well, cool. Yeah. So now would you agree that you cover things that the mainstream media kind of overlooks or doesn't seem to bring to light? Uh, that and, uh, the stuff that the mainstream media just gets plain wrong, the stuff that they cover (laughs) in the wrong way. (laughs) Right. Right. So I was looking in your background and I noticed that, uh, you have a, uh, bachelor's of Christian studies from Arizona Christian University. And do you think that not having, uh, say like a degree in business or, or, or finance has been beneficial and not having kind of your thought process um, warped and able to kind of see, see the financial markets and see things from a, a different lens? Yeah, well, I would say that other than the fact that uh, so that that's what I got my degree in. And then I kind of got the bug for, you know, personal finance and investing and started studying. And then I was like, you know what, I want to, you know, dive into the belly of beast and learn about this, you know, as much as I can. So the only thing that I knew was I should go get a job in the industry. So I kind of weaseled my way in to become a stockbroker and got, you know, all the licenses that you can get and worked my way through the industry and um, did did a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different things over the course of about five years. And um, so during that time, I was getting all of the all of the education, all the training, all of the stuff that you'd kind of get a little bit of a sample of if you went to go get a degree. Um, and uh, and so I would say that, but unfortunately, I did kind of dive into the belly of beast. I drank the Kool Aid for a couple of years, and once things started not adding up. That's when I had to start, you know, kind of seeing, hey, what, what's, what's on the outside? What do, you know, what I started having to read books. Basically, I, I became a reader and I uh, had to do some study to figure out, okay, you know, this doesn't make sense. So how does the system really work? And it just got to a point then when I couldn't, you know, really in good faith with integrity, keep on doing what I was doing and selling what I was selling. So that's when I went out on my own and, uh, you know, the rest is history. Yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit uh, about the pod or the, the YouTube channel, um, how often do you typically post and, and what, got, what made you just decide to come up with that idea and start doing that? Yeah, well, it wasn't, uh, it, that wasn't an idea that I had at first. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so I guess this is probably typical of everybody who goes, you know, to, or most people who go to start a business. Um, what you think you're going to be doing in the beginning ends up being very different from what you actually end up doing. And, um, and so I kind of uh, approached it with a, a shotgun like mentality, you know, throw the spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. And one of the things that I, a big mistake I made in the beginning was I built a bunch of stuff and then I realized I don't have anybody to sell to. <laughs> and so then I, after, you know, spending too long building something to sell without having anybody to sell to, then I had to start building an audience. And so then that was my main focus was trying to find the best way to build an audience. And YouTube was what, you know, worked best out of, you know, all, you know, I tried blogging and, you know, some other things. And um, so when YouTube stuck, that's when I uh, kind of then went all in on YouTube just about two years ago. It was, it was January of, um, or December of 2019, January of 2020, when I started, you know, focusing basically all my attention on uh, my YouTube channel, started posting once a day. Um, and then I, um, and then now I post, I, I've been trying to ramp it up. So I'm trying to hit, you know, two or three videos a day. Yeah, well, I noticed today you had two, uh, you know, pretty good ones uh, out, as a matter of fact. Um, so that, yeah, they were interesting. I wasn't able to complete the second one, but uh, anyway. So what's uh, so now? Are you, you live in Arizona, is that right? Is it you, where are you mm-hmm. originally from? Are you from there originally? Tell us a little bit about your early background. Yeah, yeah, I'm from Arizona, so uh, I'm a desert rat here. Enjoy the heat, and uh, right now, actually, it's you know the, the weather can't complain. It's you know 70 degrees outside during the day, so it's great. Yeah, yeah, I, w- I can imagine that uh, Arizona would be pleasant in the winter. Um, mm-hmm. 
supposed to get into the 20s uh, probably tomorrow night. So, oh man. Of course, the thing about Texas is, you know, it's it, you know, it's like 70 out there right now, and we'll be 20, you know, tomorrow or something. So, you know, <laughs> you, that you know, the saying if you don't like the weather in Texas, just wait, it'll change. Sure. That's what we got going. So now, um, what, uh, what kind of causes or things uh, that really kind of get you passionate? It's really involved in um, that really, you know, kind of touched you and, and got you stirred up. Yeah, I, I think so. The the reason why I do what I do, if you kind of boil it down to the to the, like the 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 core purpose or um, you know what wakes me up in the morning and what drives me is the fact that money is at least fifty percent most of the time more of everything that everybody does all the time. So you live in your house, you pay your mortgage or your rent, you go out to eat with friends, you're paying the bill, you work for eight hours, 10 hours every day to sell your time for money. So at the other half of every single thing that we do, half of that transaction is money. And so the the very fact that we have a system that Half of all we do is controlled and manipulated by, you know, uh, a few individuals, relatively speaking, um, that get, is, there's unprecedented power centralized there, number one. And then number two, the reason why we're in this situation is because of the lack of financial education. If everybody knew how the system worked and everybody knew uh, you know, was financially literate and everybody knew how to be, uh, you know, how to invest and how to save and, you know, get out of bad debt and use good debt and use, you know, do, you know, all the things, just the basics. The fact is that we wouldn't be in this situation as a country. We wouldn't be in this situation as states, co- companies, individuals, families, and uh, the world would be a much better place. And so if we, uh, if, if the more people who understand how money works, the better off individuals will be. And the better off everybody will be, the system as a whole. And so that's really what drives me and wakes me up and in the morning is, you know, educating people about how the system works and how to get ahead, because ultimately we're all going to be better off that way. And uh, there's a desperate need for it. So now where do you get your information, your news um, about what you, you cover? Because, I mean, I, you, you come up with things that I, I just haven't seen out there. And I mean, I, I like to think I'm pretty well informed. Yeah, I mean, that is the uh, that is the hardest part about kind of being a content creator is finding things to make content about, whether you're a podcaster or YouTuber or you're doing, you know, Instagram or TikTok or Twitter or whatever it is that you're creating a lot of content for. That's literally the hardest part of, you know, to talk to anybody. That's that is the that is the key. And so that's most of that's pro- other than the, the time spent actually making the videos. You know, that's that's pretty much all I do is look for stuff to make videos about. And so I'm constantly on every single news site there is on Twitter. I'm looking at the content that other people are making. I'm just I'm re I read books constantly because then that that, you know, if if you want to be able to produce, you can only put out what you're what you're taking in, basically. And so um, I'm, I'm constantly trying to, you know, consume education that'll educate me, that'll train me, that'll, uh, you know, uh, improve, you know, my thoughts and my mind. And then uh, that'll give me a base to uh, be able to produce from. So um, you said you read a lot of books. What are like a couple, two or three that you would uh, say are essential for everybody to read? Yeah, there's uh, there are a few books that I read every single year, um, and uh, um, like so, I, I read probably I read uh, just about a hundred books a year. I read about two books a week, and uh, there are only a few that I read repeatedly. Um, one of them is uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear. Mm-hmm. And um, that one is probably the one that I recommend the most simply because it's it has the most easily digestible and um, distilled wisdom on being able to improve your life. And the it's very applicable. And when you do apply it, it works. It's very effective. Um, and so I recommend that one probably more than anything. Um, the next set of books is by uh, Nassim Taleb. It's first Black Swan, then Anti-Fragile, then Skin in the Game. 
Um, and those three by him, I think are essential to understanding um, kind of the structure of the way that reality works, whether you're looking at the financial world or, you know, a, a, it, it's kind of like it describes the underlying structure um, to, uh, to how the world works. And, um, and it's, it's just fascinating the insights that, that he has in those books and then kind of being able to design your life around that, how, uh, you know, placing small bets and, you know, it's just, they're, they're fantastic. Um, so I would say those would be, those would be the, the top four books that I, uh, I recommend most that are just most broadly applicable. And so who's your favorite author out of these guys? Uh, there's somebody else that you know, like their work, but maybe yeah. not a book you recommend as much. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Ray Dalio is an excellent author because he's so uh, nuanced. Um, his books are a little bit longer and some of them are a little bit more in detail. So some of them are a little bit harder to read, but I really like him. Nassim Taleb too. I mean, I think his, I, I think he's probably up there. I would many times say he's He's one of my favorite authors. Okay. So now, as a matter of fact, you've written three books. Uh, a couple of them were children's books, that correct? Cash is King and Giving is Great. Yeah. So that's a throwback to what I said earlier about throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. And so uh, early on, yeah, I, uh, I wrote, a, I did a little self-published book on um, the, uh, uh, just the general, if you're just getting started what to do, uh, kind of like a, a uh, an action plan for, uh, you know, starting to make more money, getting out of debt, uh, starting to invest and then protecting your investments. It's very basic, very short. And um, then my other two books are children's books because I have two kids. I've got a five-year-old and a four-year-old. And at the time that would have been what, uh, you know, three and two. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so they've just got some illustrations, they rhyme. Um, and uh, they're about generosity and debt. And so, uh, yeah, I do have, uh, I do have those. Well, that's good. Kid, now, are all those available? I, I know that uh, the Heresy Financial book is on Amazon. I saw it, but there are the children's books on Amazon as well. Can you get a hold of those? Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, and then uh, now you also have been on a speaking tour. As a matter of fact, you're coming here to uh, our neck of the woods up in Dallas on March 5th. Um, how often do you do that? And, and what do you, you typically cover? Seems like you're um, going to be partnering with somebody else, at least on the one in uh, Dallas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So th that's something that uh, this year I've, I've really started uh, kind of ramping up more um, and uh, the opportunities have been coming in and I love speaking in person and going to events and meeting people doing, you know, meet and greets and things like that. So we did a, uh, a meet and greet. I did a meet and greet in Denver with a couple other YouTubers. Um, the biggest one would be Economic Ninja and then uh, Rob Keynes from Gold Silver Pros and then uh, um, Jack from Nobody Special and a couple others. And so that was a lot of fun. That was like a, that just a meet and greet. And so this one that we're doing in Dallas, um, it's on uh, March 5th. And uh, this is an actual, you know, kind of like a speaking event. It's an all day uh, training. So we'll be talking about like, I'll be talking specifically on investing uh, in uh, hyperinflation. Um, and uh, the other guys will be talking about stuff like investing in real estate and small businesses and, you know, stuff that can't, a lot of stuff that we can't say on YouTube to, to be honest, because of censorship and, you know, uh, so, some legal reasons and things like that. And so um, that's kind of the focus of the event. And then um, there's a, a VIP package available too, if, if anybody wants to come the night before as well and uh, get dinner with us. Um, I, I think there's still some tickets left. I'm not sure those have been going pretty quick, but yeah, we're doing that in Dallas on March 5th. And so it should be, uh, should be a really good time. So now where could you get tickets? You go to your website or is there another place, Eventbrite, what, where are you? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a link and you can put it in the description of this video. And then um, I will. I also have it linked in the description of all my recent YouTube videos as well, but I'll give you the link so you can link it down below. Okay. And so now what was the, the thought process behind the, uh, the name Heresy Financial? Why'd you choose that? Yeah. Uh, because so a couple of reasons. 
The word heresy means an opinion that is profoundly at odds with what is generally accepted. And if you look back throughout history, especially like religious history, the people who were initially labeled heretics um, were typically the ones who had stumbled across a truth that the establishment just didn't want to admit to yet. And history proved them right later on. And the truth wins out in the end. And so, uh, especially when I started, you know, there, you know, there's a lot of people doing, you know, the, doing great work, uh, telling the truth, uh, getting the word out about how the system works and not being afraid of censorship and all of that. And, um, you know, when I first started, I didn't realize how, you know, there, that, that there are a good number of people out there that are, that are doing that. Um, and so I felt kind of like a heretic, like I, you know, Hey, I figured out the truth about how this works and, really everything that is being pushed is kind of the reality is kind of the opposite. And so uh, this, this, the stuff that I talk about is really consider to the mainstream, at least to the establishment, it really is considered heretical and uh, as if it's heresy. And so uh, that, that's the, uh, that, that's the idea behind the name. So why do you think it is? Why do you think it is? So, um, you know, counter to the mainstream kind of understanding of, of, finances and that sort of thing. What, what purpose does this, you know, structure really serve? I mean, I know obviously it makes certain people really wealthy, but, you know, it seems like um, with people doing other stuff, it, um, you know, you could be just as, you know, they could be just as wealthy um, if people, you know, kind of taking care of themselves. Yeah. I mean, you have to look at, at I mean, I think, the the most one of the most important things to look at when you're when the question is why is the structure of the system this way is how are, how are the incentives structured just like charlie munger says show me the incentives and i'll show show you the outcome and uh, when you trace the incentives back it's one where um, the people who benefit most by having the system the way it is are the ones who are in power to change it and but if they were to change it, then it would uh, the incentive structure would shift and they wouldn't be benefiting from it anymore. And so uh, an example of this is the fact that the money supply regularly increases at a gradual pace. And then sometimes it increases in an explosion. It, it increases very rapidly. Like and, a couple of years. <laughs> exactly. Yep. And um, the, the nature of a system that works like that means that the money supply is always growing, which means that as that money works its way throughout the economy, uh, it uh, bids up good, the prices of goods and services more than they would be otherwise. And uh, the reason for that is because you've got more money chasing the same amount of goods and services. So the money becomes less valuable relative to all the stuff. That means that stuff becomes more valuable relative to all the money, which means that stuff costs more. Um, you need more money to get the stuff. And um, over time, who that benefits the most is the person who gets the money first. And uh, think of uh, think of if you're uh, playing Monopoly. If you double everybody's money on the board all at once, then everybody benefits at first and starts buying hotels and properties and homes on their properties and all that. And prices eventually get bid up, the rents go up and all that. But if you just give the money to one person, they benefit disproportionately because they get all the extra money and they're the only one that can bid up the price. And so as they go around the board, nobody else is bidding up the prices ahead of them. They're the ones that get to lose all the extra money. And then by the time that new money works its way through to all the other players, prices have already risen from that one player that got to spend it all at the old prices. And so uh, the, that's the way that uh, the money flows. It goes to primarily the government first that gets to spend it all on everything they want to spend it on. And they spend it to where? The corporations with the government contracts. So they're the second recipients of that money. And so the, the large corporations that, that have influence over the government and then especially the government have the incentive to keep this because they get a lot richer as a result. And really what it is, it's a wealth transfer because by the time that money works its way throughout the economy and everybody else now has to start paying higher prices and incomes go up last, everybody's paying those higher prices. And uh, so really what happened was the rich and the powerful got richer. Everybody else got poorer. That's a wealth transfer. And so the, the structure is kind of cemented that way because the people who have the power to change are the ones who benefit by it staying that way. Okay. So now, um, 
Why do you think uh, rich people are buying farmland right now? Is it just a inflation hedge, or do you think they see some sort of difficulty in global food production coming down? Sure. Well, that's yeah, that's that's definitely an option. You know, that's that's uh, you know, it's a good hedge against uh, potential instability in the future to you know own some farmland. Um, another reason for it is if you look, look back at history, when you have uh, periods of time where there's high inflation, um, real assets like land typically do the best, especially if you have fixed rate leverage, fixed rate mortgages on the uh, on the property debt. And so um, uh, in, in addition to just being land, if you have that land have a producing asset on it, then that really does well. And in times of high inflation, uh, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy, you know, you're going to go from, you know, you're going to give up your luxuries first and you're going to give up your oxygen last, right? And so your food and your water, that's one of the last things that you'll give up. And so uh, during times of high economic pain where inflation is going through the roof, the thing that you're going to, uh, people are going to keep on buying is food. And so if you've got farmland, that's a, that's a hedge, a perfect hedge against inflation, high inflation or hyperinflation, because people are always going to be buying the food. And if you look at the Weimar Republic in Germany, when they were going through their hyperinflation, um, there was, uh, you know, the, the farmers were the people with, you know, land, you know, one acre, half an acre and a couple cows or a couple sheep, you know, nothing massive like we have today, no factories, just a couple animals. They were the ones that still had producing assets that people had to buy. And as prices went through the roof, you went from a dollar for an egg to $10 for an egg to $100 for an egg. And um, as that happened, they had fixed rate debt on their uh, properties that they were able to start paying off. They could make a payment by selling one egg. And so they were paying off their mortgages. And people would ask them, they're like, what do you do? You're exploiting us. You're, you, this is exploitative right now. You're just taking advantage of everybody. They're like, what are you doing with all these massive profits? And they're like, we're paying off our mortgages. Like we were smart enough to see ahead and uh, have, you know, real producing assets um, and not, uh, you know, uh, rely on the value of uh, a devalued currency. Um, and so that that's a big part of uh, big part of what's going on and why big money is uh, buying farmland right now. Okay. So, uh, Joe, do you think the labor market's going to uh, win or when do you think it'll normalize or will it normalize coming in? Because I know, uh, you know, it's, it's been difficult for small business folks here to find, uh, you know, the uh, I'm not necessarily just lower end, but say the 15 to $20 an hour uh, folks. Uh, what do you see happening with that in the future? long term i guess both yeah yeah it's a good question and uh it's right now it's kind of hard to tell there because there are a couple things happening right now um mm -hmm. number one in the wake of the stimulus when people got stimulus checks but that wasn't it you know there were there were a lot of other uh ways to get your hands on money other than just the stimulus checks including a lot of people with mortgages refinanced to lower their payment and to cash out refinances to get a big lump sum a huge uh cash infusion to a lot of American households gave people the ability to say, you know what? I'm fed up. I've been fed up for years. I'm done. I'm quitting. I'm out. And that started kind of a churn. And then as people are quitting, companies have to start slowly raising their uh, uh, incentives to come get hired. And as you're working somewhere and you turn around, you see somebody just got hired with a five grand, 10 grand, 20 grand bonus. You're, and you're looking at other companies that are offering the same thing. You're going to go to the other company, you know, just to get your bonus. And so we've seen not only like they're calling it a great resignation, but it's really a great churn because you see hirings skyrocketing alongside. And so it's not as if there's, you know, an, a, a, just just people resigning and leaving the workforce forever. Certainly, we've had a huge drop in labor force participation, but uh, the, uh, the churn rate is very high. The number of people getting hired is very high. And so that's something that's causing wages to go up and uh, companies are going to start uh, at some point probably going to have to cut staff and, you know, kind of reduce the number of people they're hiring if they can't uh, keep up with the costs of, of labor there. Uh, and that'd be a longer term thing, you know, you know, replacing more and more people with, you know, robots and, you know, uh, touch screens for, you know, checkouts and things like that. Um, 
The other thing that's going on in addition to that is especially with younger people, there's, there's a really big uh, entrepreneurial wave going on right now where a lot of people are going out on their own and they're saying, I'm going to start, you know, doing a side hustle. I'm going to start a little website. I'm going to start, you know, working, doing some online, you know, whether it's content creation or whether it's, you know, uh, e-commerce or something like that. Uh, they're especially with young people because their expenses are a lot lower and um, they've, you know, maybe a little bit of a cash infusion. Maybe they're still, you know, living with roommates or something like that. There is a big movement right now of uh, uh, just, just trying to go out on your own. And so that's a big, reason for the labor force participation rate dropping so much and not rebounding back to where it was because there's a lot of people who should be in the counted in the workforce but they're just not applying for jobs anymore because they're trying to get their own thing started and that's another thing that i really view as beneficial long term because um you know it's from like a meaning standpoint in life you can't find it, it's with a group. Once a group size gets over 120 people, um, the, the the ability for you to find meaning and feel attached to the group is basically zero. 120 is kind of the maximum group size where you feel any uh, affinity for the, for the crowd, for the group, for the tribe. And so the more we get smaller businesses, the more we get entrepreneurs, the more we get uh, small, agile, you know, fast moving um, businesses. I, I think that's absolutely fantastic for our country long term and so i really hope that that continues that trend continues and grows that's that's very beneficial so those are some things going on right now and ultimately we don't know what will happen long term um but uh there there are some there's some moves happening right now yeah one of the things that concerned me initially <clears throat> like i uh, had a guy that was a uh, farm implement manufacturer but not you know, not like industrial farm, but like the, you know, the, the guy that has a few acres and that sort of thing, a hay spare, a few little things, the smaller end stuff, right? And when he, prior to, you know, everything kind of going crazy a couple of years ago, right? Um, he had a handful of folks, you know, in very skilled positions there making about 30 bucks an hour. Well, then all of a sudden, seems like everybody got all the stimulus money and all of these, you know, things that they were going to, you know, planned on buying over maybe the next five years or six years, you know, like a, an addition to a front end loader or a, this kind of little thing or that kind of little thing, you know, when they got the stimulus money and, and various, they just, they, they spent it all. So his orders skyrocketed. So he had to hire people. Of course it was difficult to get people. So now his base wage is 30. Right. And so, that's not sustainable, right? I mean, if I've already, you know, because of whatever reason, I've bought all of the, you know, the kind of the toys I'm planning on buying for the next five years, and I bought them all this year where I would have staggered them out. I mean, I'm probably going to stop. I'm probably not going to need anything else that he has for a while. And then it worried me that then we would have this backlash of, you know, huge unemployment because we ramped all these things up uh, in order to, you know, to compensate for, this huge influx of, of business. Do you see anything like that as a possible fear? Or, I mean, as it's stabilizing out now, I'm thinking I might have just, uh, maybe not, uh, you know, I, maybe I just kind of uh, dream something up. I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, no, that's true. And I, I'm sure that that is happening uh, or it will happen uh, to some extent. Um, from what I, what, from what I've been able to gather about at least the large companies, the publicly traded mm -hmm. ones, um, you know, the, the, the top 500, the, the big ones, they're not, uh, they've been over the last two years, very hesitant to uh, react to the demand spike because of that very thing. They don't want to get into a situation where they're like, oh, there's a bunch of new real demand here. So we're going to invest a ton to meet the new demand. And then you wind up like Peloton where, you know, everybody already bought one and they're yeah. the same as any other treadmill, any other bike. And so, uh, and now they're, they're just getting crushed and they're cratering. Um, and so, yeah, sure. I'm 100% sure that's happening out there. I don't think it's very widespread. Um, addition, in addition to that, um, specifically in America, most of what we buy is consumable goods. And the nature of a consumable good is that it's consumable. You consume it, then you throw it away and then you need more of it. And most of what people bought with their stimulus checks, I think like 75% of it or something, uh, the data shows went to close. Um, 
and uh, again, consumable good. And so uh, it not it most of most of that wasn't going to uh, you know hard assets or uh, investments in equipment and things like that that were produced long term that would contribute actually to you know to deflation. And so to the extent that new money keeps on entering the system, you can have sustained demand for consumable goods as long as the, you know, the, uh, there is production of stuff that can be consumed, which ultimately we get most of it from other countries like China. And so uh, I, it, that, that kind of dynamic can, can continue as long as the money keeps on flowing, which right now it looks like the Fed may be shutting that off soon. So we'll see what happens there, but uh, um, but yeah, that 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 uh, fear has been in the minds of top CEOs in the country for the last two years, and that's one of the reasons why the you know uh, supply chain issues have persisted because they've been very hesitant to uh, increase you know inventory and things like that. Yeah, do you see a, uh, a great influx of manufacturing coming back to at least North America, or what do you think? I think at some point it'll be necessary. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, mainly away from China, but uh, particularly right now. But uh, yeah, do you, do you see? Are you seeing or or looking at any data that shows that that's actually happening? I mean, I think everybody kind of agrees it should, but I mean, it, you know, are the companies actually deciding to to do that? Yeah, so I, so far I haven't seen anything that suggests it's happening right now. Long term, you know, when you consider even just statistically just a reversion to the mean, uh, you'd imagine it'd happen at some point. Um, now, the 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 flip side of the coin is that when you look at this from like the standpoint of um, uh, like a comparative advantage, a lawyer, let's say, has can type at eighty words per minute. Um, and he hires a secretary, let's say, that can uh, type at 40 words per minute. Um, so the lawyer has an advantage over oh. his secretary and he's paying his secretary to do something that he can do twice as efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, but for every hour he spends typing, that's an hour he's not spending making money. And he makes $1,000 an hour. And so every hour that he spends typing, he's losing a thousand dollars, but he's only paying his secretary fifty dollars an hour. And so there is a comparative advantage for the lawyer to pay somebody else to do a job less efficiently than he could simply because he wins overall if he does that, because what he's doing instead is so much better. And uh, the same thing happens between countries. And you know, from a free market perspective, you would, you, you would still see this. And so countries like Singapore that have zero natural resources can still have a thriving economy. And what I think they have the <laughs> most millionaires per capita or they're up there, you know, richest per capita in the world um, with no natural resources. And uh, and so you can you can you can still have, you know, dynamics between countries where certain countries have they're the best at manufacturing in the world and they do all the manufacturing and other countries are the best at producing software in the world and they produce all the software and, you know, vice versa all around the world. You can still have that in a free market. It doesn't all come down to, uh, you know, manipulation and currency manipulation and politics and uh, trade agreements. Although those things all do make the problem side of those things worse, mm -hmm. um, but uh, even in the, even in a completely free market globally, you'd still have those things happen. Sure. So now uh, you had a uh, uh, show about the uh, Fed kept rolling out the uh, I guess the uh, the phase at which they ask you ask the public what they think about it before they do what they want to do. Uh, for a Fed stable coin. And uh, tell me a little bit uh, about that and kind of what your thoughts are on that and, and where somebody can find a, a way to comment on that. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the thing about the Federal Reserve and uh, the, it's, it's a central bank digital currency that is being researched and piloted all around the world right now. And um, it's in pretty much every article you will ever find on it, um, it is whether unintentionally or intentionally, it's CBDCs are CBDC is the acronym for central bank digital currency. It's conflated with a cryptocurrency. Mm 
Part of the reason for that is because they're going to use the similar or the same underlying technology. Uh, however, the application is so different that it's basically, it's just not, it's not a cryptocurrency. So if you use one extreme, like, you know, let's say Bitcoin, Bitcoin is, you know, uncensorable. Uh, you can't stop a transaction from taking place. You can't cause a transaction to be reversed. Um, it's pseudonymous, meaning there's a level of anonymity, although it's not, it's not anonymous because every transaction is traced. You can trace it back to the beginning. Um, pseudonymous means it's not your name on there with your social security. It's just a wallet. Um, and so, but that wallet has an address on the public record. It's also a public ledger, meaning that anybody who wants to can see every single transaction that's ever take, taken place all the way back to the original transaction. So those are kind of like the, the pillars, the hallmarks of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. If you take a CBDC, a central bank digital currency, um, it is censorable, meaning the transactions can be stopped. The transactions are reversible, meaning that if they see a transaction happen that they don't want to happen, they can make it go back because they have complete control over it. Um, it is uh, uh, completely private and only the allowed individuals, which would be like the Federal Reserve and the banks, would be allowed to see all of the data. Um, nobody else would have any visibility into the data. And then uh, number four, it is uh, not pseudonymous. It is completely all of your information is plugged in for, you know, uh, you know, uh, for legal reasons, for uh, preventing um, uh, 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 money laundering is the word I was trying to think of and, uh, and terrorism and things like that. And so you, they'll have all your date of birth, your social security number, all of that. And so you have a small centralized system controlled by the central bank that would be able to see every transaction, would have the power to stop transactions and would see all the data from everybody's transaction. And not only that, but um, the other, the other uh, big difference is if you look at Bitcoin, the monetary policy, who can create more Bitcoin? Nobody, it just automatically gets assigned to the miners at a specific pace until the very last Bitcoin gets assigned in the year 2100. And then that's it. And the, then the only way to get more Bitcoin is to sell something to somebody that has Bitcoin that they're willing to give you for what you're trying to sell them. Um, with a central bank digital currency, it's the exact opposite. They completely control the supply. They can create more, destroy some at will, assign them to whoever they want, whenever they want, and take away units of that currency from whoever they want, whenever they want. And this isn't like conspiracy. This is the uh, 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 Biden's nominee for the office of the comptroller of the currency. Her name is Omarova. She, uh, um, I think she either studied in Russia or um, uh, maybe even like grew up there. I don't remember, but uh, she uh, published a paper and um, wrote it a couple years ago. And now it's just recently been published on um, on how a the Federal Reserve could successfully implement a central bank digital currency. And she explicitly states in there, in order to fight deflation, the Federal Reserve would create new units of currency and assign it out to people. Just like the stimulus checks, they would just assign it into people's accounts, like create new dollars and they would show up in people's accounts. She's specifically said to fight inflation, the Federal Reserve could deduct money from people's accounts. In order to fight bubbles, the Federal Reserve could short stocks. In order to fight crashes, the Federal Reserve could buy stocks, or this could apply to other assets. And so um, basically this whole idea, this whole plan, this whole thing around central bank digital currencies is to uh, uh, exponentially increase the level of power and control that the central bank has over the economy in assigning money where they think it needs to go to fine tune certain areas of the economy. If they want certain businesses to get more money, they'll assign money to accounts and say, people, this money is going to expire unless you spend it on food. This money is going to expire unless you spend it on gas. This money is uh, going to expire unless you spend it in a week. You know, you could have expiration dates on money. Um, and uh, so all sorts of different things that the money could be programmed for and programmed to do in order to try and fine tune the economy. And the one thing that we know about complex systems is that every action 
every single action is a butterfly effect in in the negative sense and so when you mess with complex systems to that degree the only like the silver lining the ray of hope is that it will collapse under its own weight it's just a disaster waiting to happen and and it won't work long term so the the, the tyranny would fail yeah so uh, you know i've had this conversation recently after seeing your uh podcast with a number of banker friends of mine and <clears throat> they don't seem to be and all phased or concerned at all. But I'm thinking to myself, okay, so if I have one of these Federal Reserve, uh, you know, accounts, why do I need a bank account? I mean, especially when you look at things like, you know, the, I don't know if you'd heard about it, but the the post office is doing a, you know, payday, uh, a check cashing payday lending, um, you know, pilot program. I mean, <laughs> You know, had, this would, I don't understand why the bankers aren't just all up and uh, I can understand why Wells Fargo and Bank of America and those guys aren't, of course, because we have to have some semblance of, uh, you know, competition. But, you know, the small local banker, I mean, why do you need them if, you know, uh, you know, especially, I mean, all they have to do is add lending to it. They already set the interest rate. So, I mean, I, I, don't, I mean, am I off track there or do you see similar concern no so uh two the two things about that not not a face at all it's a perfect question because uh the definition of a central bank digital currency you you that the question always comes up they're like well that's digital money my money's already digital it's just ones and zeros it's just in an account like nobody's going and using cash these days and if they are it's not for everything it's you know a little bit of cash here and there and um, so money's already digital today, 99.99% of it. And so um, when you ask like, what, well, what is a central bank digital currency actually change? Here's what it changes. Right now, there's all the banks. And with the banks, individuals and businesses have their accounts. All of the banks then, they have accounts as well with the central bank. And the reason it was established that way in the beginning was because all these banks had gold that they had to redeem for their bank notes at any given time. And sometimes this bank, they might've accidentally lent out a little bit too much. And so there'd be a bank run and everybody'd be like, give me your gold. They'd be like, I don't have it. So they'd call up the Federal Reserve and they'd be like, hey, there's a bank run. And so the Federal Reserve would be like, all right, we've got some gold. So they'd funnel some gold to that bank that was having a bank run and they would get it from all the other banks. And so you, there, the idea was you'd have more stability in the banking system because the banks could basically bail each other out, out through the uh, central bank. Uh, well, all that is, you know, that's, you know, history because w- there's no gold in the system anymore. Uh, but you still have all of the banks have their accounts with the central bank, the Federal Reserve. The only other entity that has an account directly with the Federal Reserve is the federal government. Um, and uh, so right now, if you want an account at the Fed, you have to be a bank or the government. The CBDC, all it does is it says in ke- instead of having an account with a bank, you have an account directly with the Fed. So now instead of just the banks having an account with the Fed, individuals and businesses have accounts with the Fed. And so that means that if you want to be able to receive your tax refund, if you want to be able to have have a legal business where you have a, a, a business license that says, yes, you're legally allowed to do business without getting shut down, you might have to have an account with the Federal Reserve. You might have to have a wallet with the Fed. And That means that if you want to go do business with a business that has an account at the Fed, you want to buy something, they may only legally be allowed to accept Federal Reserve digital currency into their wallet, which can only come from other wallets. And so it might get to a point where the only way to do business uh, would be having an account at the Federal Reserve. Now, where the the fear, uh, why the fear is not showing up in the banking system, because essentially, you know, you're eradicating the banking system then, right? So all the bankers and all the profits and all that, the way that it would be rolled out would be to use the banks as the infrastructure, because the Fed doesn't have the resources, the manpower, the infrastructure to carry this out for 330 million people, plus all the businesses. It's just not possible. But the infrastructure, the plumbing in that system already exists with the banks. So the banking system would essentially be nationalized and rolled under the Fed completely to be the plumbing of that system. And so they still exist. They just kind of become government employees at that point. Yeah, but, you know, you, you would think these guys would uh, uh, would see it a little more. I mean, the same thing happened to them like uh, I was in the mortgage industry 
when I started back in the uh, late uh, 80s, early 90s, you know, there were lots of banks that serviced their own mortgage notes. I mean, lots of them, you know, you originated and, and they serviced themselves. Now, the regulatory requirements to do that make it almost impossible um, for, a, you know, for a, you know, a, a, just any, I mean, there's just a handful of folks that service mortgages now. I mean, yeah. you know, they're just, I mean, obviously there's, you know, small, you know, adjustable rate and more intensive bank notes, but I'm talking about your 30 year fixed mortgage, which, you know, you used to go to the bank to get that, you know, until the SNL collapsed. But, um, you know, they've seen it, they know what happens. They, you know, but uh, I mean, and, and they're seeing it right now. I mean, you already have, um, you know, the consolidation of banks. I mean, every time you turn around one, you know, some regional bank has, you know, bought out, uh, you know, several little small ones. I mean, we just had two in our market, you know, bite the dust to a regional uh, player. And, you know, but it's like, it. I don't get, I guess, you know, nobody's looking, you know, two, three, four steps ahead and sees how this is going to go. And I, and I don't know, I mean, I, I've argued with them and I don't know, that's not going to happen. I mean, I, how do you make that, how do you make that light uh, bulb come on in these guys, uh, you know, mindset? Yeah, well, it's the same thing with the the taxi drivers in, you know, it, it, like in New York City, especially yeah. when Uber was coming onto the scene. The number one argument against uh, why Uber wouldn't work was because, oh, it'll never, you know, governments will never allow it. it, it it'll be illegal. The, you know, unions are too powerful. It'll never, it'll never beat taxis. Um, and so nobody, nobody ever sees things like this coming, especially if it affects their livelihood. In fact, if it affects your livelihood, you've got a built-in mental incentive to not see it coming because it's just, that's just the way you're uh, uh, kind of conditioned to uh, see the world unless you intentionally try and see things differently. Yeah, that's probably true. Um, here, here's another uh, question I have. I mean, there's a lot of tension between um, China and the U.S. over Taiwan and, and I mean, clearly we're decoupling. Um, and one of the things that, that, that I'm concerned about is uh, that there's a lot of money on, you know, big company balance sheet, you know, sheets that may not actually be liquid money because it's sitting over uh, with CCP control and they may not be able to get that out if and when the time comes. And uh, do you, have you, have you seen any data on that or have any, you know, um, information about that yeah i mean th that's uh, that's very possible i think you know there there's an argument to be made that uh the uh uh it's, it's a little bit intentional kind of like spreading out your bets like for instance uh, it's it'd be similar to an individual who says you know i i know that if i want to buy gold holding physical i eliminate counterparty risk but if I have it in my safe, that doesn't stop somebody from coming over to my house, breaking in and stealing it. So in order to protect myself against that, I'll also have some in a private vault in a different country. And yeah, that country might, you know, figure out about it and change their laws and do the same thing. But then at least I have my uh, bets spread out. And so I lose 50% instead of 100%. Maybe my odds go up, but my total... Uh, uh, um, uh, my total potential loss goes down. And so there is some element to that where, uh, you know, spreading out your risks for, uh, you know, geopolitical reasons and why stocks and companies usually do survive long term throughout wars and throughout uh, currency changes and things like that, because they've got the ability to be a little bit more um, uh, dynamic. Okay. But um, so, yeah, what do you think the greatest challenge for small business owners is going to be here in the you know, short term and then long term? Yeah, it's so funny because it's really it's it's sad because it's the opposite of the way that things are naturally um, small businesses naturally are uh, better are uh, faster, are quicker, are able to adjust to the market quicker, are more innovative, 
um, are more passionate than bigger companies. And the data is out there. If you look at the performance of any company that goes through a merger and acquisition versus companies that are spun off. No, first of all, just mergers and acquisitions versus like the S&P 500. Uh, they always underperform. There's so much extra fat. There's bloating. There's you know uh, you know trying to figure out how to merge these companies that have existed separately for so long. Um, there's uh, it's the the track record of mergers and acquisitions is absolutely terrible, and uh, uh, the, not better than the S P 500. Uh, then compare that with stocks that are spun off. Or stocks that are, um, you know, even the parent company after a spinoff happens, they just they, they outperform the stock market on total like every single year. They're almost without exception, um, and by a decent amount. And the reason for that is because you get smaller, you get leaner, you get faster, you can adjust. Your incentives are aligned better. There's less people. There's more uh, cohesiveness inside the organization. There's uh, leaders that are well connected to the the whole entire organization structure. You don't have as much fat. You've trimmed the fat. You're able to do things more quickly and that are better for just you know what you're doing. And so smaller is better. Uh, we see that in nature. You know, rabbits versus elephants. Which one is going to be able to fall from a higher height without uh without getting hurt and run run further and faster and and uh, replicate faster um and all of that and so uh small businesses should be able to uh continually be putting big businesses out of business that's the natural course of things small business competitive advantage grows bigger out competes the big one the big one fails the small one then becomes big and incumbent and then repeats the process cycle of life um, but instead, the, and this is the answer to your question, what do you think the biggest challenge is? The system that we have set up is one that protects the incumbents. Um, it's one where every new law, every new regulation is something that is easy for an incumbent, easy for a big company to adjust to and to respond to, and many times impossible for a small company. There is a reason why Robinhood is the newest uh, uh, brokerage firm basically on the market. There's a couple others that popped up recently, you know, just like Robinhood around the same time. And the only reason Robinhood could get off the ground is because they had like Google and massive uh, capital backing them. Um, and to, to relative to, you know, the incumbents, you know, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs and Charles Schwab and Fidelity and Vanguard and all that, they were, uh, they were innovative. They responded. They forced the entire industry. To Imagine what would happen if there were, uh, you know, only 10% of the rules and the regulations were gone. The red tape was gone. The paperwork was gone. And a team of five people could start a new company, could write an app that could, you know, you could buy and sell stocks with. Imagine uh, how much easier it would be for small companies to compete with the big companies. But the big companies have the money. They've got the lobbyists. They get the regulations passed that help them and hurt competitors, hurt small startups. And it's not just finance. It's healthcare. It's everything. Um, it's, it's in every single business. And the money flows to them first. Remember our monopoly example. The money flows to them first after it gets to the government. And so they have the resources to continue this. And uh, they're the ones that continue to put these politicians back in power, give them the money to get back in power so that they continue this cycle. And so it's a self-reinforcing cycle here that, uh, you know, they print the money, they get the spending power, they get the real power, and then they pass the laws that prevent competition from being able to come in. Um, and, uh, and all the time you still have small competitors still beating the big boys. It's very, very difficult now, uh, but that just shows how inefficient the big boys are compared to the startups. And uh, so, but I, I do think that is the biggest uh, 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 disadvantage and the biggest hurdle that small businesses have to overcome these days is um, competing with somebody who uh, has the unlimited resources to get regulatory capture and um, doesn't have to compete, but kind of gets uh, um, government granted or government sanctioned monopolies. Yeah. So how, how do you break that cycle? I mean, you know, clearly you would think that, uh, you know, the average American would not be for this if they fully understood it. But um, I mean, of course, I mean, all these guys are in bed together, right? I mean, you know, big media is in bed with big pharma is in bed with big auto with, you know, and so they're all, 
you know, kind of in the club protecting each other. So how do you break through with that sort of thing and, and educate people? Yeah, I think it's, I think we're start, we're seeing it start to fall apart right now. Um, and, and so part, part of the answer is that it just collapses under its own weight naturally. And um, uh, it's, you know, uh, uh, an elephant that falls from two inches, breaks its leg and dies, or it might be two feet. Either way, a small, a small right. amount, it'll fall and it'll uh, break its legs and die. And so when you see uh, when you see something in nature grow too big, it just collapses under its own weight. And the same thing happens with complex systems. And so we're starting to see the fractures of this gargantuan system that is trying to self-sustain it. But eventually the end of the road is if you, if you just look at the foundation, which is the money, it starts to uh, it starts to inflate and prices start to go up. And it gets to a point where at some point people stop using the currency. And then there, that's the tipping point where um, it really starts to lose its purchasing power quick. And anybody who got their power and their wealth from the wealth transfer of that inflation, that's when it starts to unwind and the, and the purchasing power flow stops, the money flow stops. And so um, I, I think that's, that's how we see, that's one uh, reason why we're starting to see it unwind right now. Um, and then the other way is, you know, like education. And this is another reason why, you know, technology is so disruptive because, you know, back even 20 years ago, who would have imagined that Hollywood would be decimated, that, uh, you know, they, they don't create more movies than the rest of the world anymore. That was that wasn't even tr- like three years ago and just last couple of years. Um, and the movies that they do create are basically all sequels or part of the same universe. There's no original work coming out anymore. And now all the original work is out for free on YouTube and uh, you know TikTok or wherever it is. That's where people are now spending their time getting their entertainment from. And, uh, it's, and it's free and the cost of production is so low. And so you've moved from a, 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 a system where it's like, you know, there's a few um, gatekeepers that have all of the business and technology has disrupted that and moved that into a uh, long tail distribution where there are millions of people with small market share along the way that each have mono- little monopolies in their own niche. And that's what technology does. You know, it used to be that music was only 1% of People with, uh, you know, that were in the music industry ever got uh, their, uh, you know, music out there for people to listen to. And now you have a kid make a song on TikTok, it blows up and, uh, you know, millions of people listen to it and, you know, overnight success. And that, that happens all the time now. And it's free. And it used to be very, very expensive. There were gatekeepers. Technology has disrupted that. And now uh, it's available, you know, uh, that, that's what technology does. It bring, makes uh, scarce things become abundant. Um, and so uh, that's kind of the uh, the course here. And that's, you know, why we're starting to see some of this fall apart. And the education piece of this, you know, education is falling apart right now because you can go online and get real education that's not from the gatekeepers um, and uh, have a discussion with everybody and figure out what's actually going on. Um, like, you know, we're doing right now and anybody has access to see it and listen to it for free. And the more that happens, the more the grip of power starts to slowly fade away. So do you see it happening like a, a domino or two at a time, industry by industry? Um, or do you see it kind of just gaining speed and and all, you know, collapsing at once at some point or the largest part of it? And then yeah. how you pick those pieces, man. That's the other thing, right? How do you pick up the pieces? Yeah, it, it, if, it, if it were to, you know, obviously if it was a nice gradual in, uh, industry by industry, collapse or restructure and it'd be one thing but um uh you know yeah but if it you know multiple industries you know fall prey at once um yeah what, what's the world look like i guess right you know how yeah pieces up and how bad is that right yeah yeah i mean it depends in a lot of times run. say it again in the short run of course we yeah i think we would both agree that we'll probably all be better on the other side of it but, you know, I'm 50 something years old. I may not live to see the other side of it. Right. So a young guy like you probably can, but, you know, I may not make it. <laughs> 
Yeah. I mean, the people that talk about events that happen like this, you know, crazy things that start happening in history, usually the way it goes is they say it, it's, um, it happens gradually then all at once. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's like, uh, an ice cube melting. Um, nothing happens when it moves from zero degrees to one degrees to two degrees to three degrees, it gets all the way to 31 degrees and not a single thing visibly noticeably has changed or happened. Uh, but all of that has built up and built up. And then the next degree, when it moves from or 32 to 33, boom, now suddenly it's water. And so uh, it's not that nothing's happening. It's that there is stuff happening. It's just not yet built up enough pressure or enough steam or enough energy to that tipping point where you start to notice the results of everything that's already happened for a very long time. Um, and so, uh, and so, yeah, I think, you know, you look back at history and you can see it very evidently when, you know, there's events that take place, you know, World War One, World War Two, hyperinflation in Germany, you see, uh, you know, very clearly, hey, there's kind of a short time frame where there's an event that happens. But there was 50 years of history that led up to that. You look at, okay, what happened the five years prior to that? Okay, well, that happened because of the five years prior to that. And then that happened because of the five years prior to that. And so, um, you know, we're kind of seeing that, you know, that momentum build, you know, Greenspan put and lowering interest rates dot com bubble. And then that caused the housing bubble crisis. And then the resolution from that caused the buildup for what they had to do to deal in March of 2020. And then the inflation that we're seeing now as a result of that. And then now they're raising rates. And so there's, there's a, you know, a, 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 a lot of momentum behind these things. Um, but eventually you look around and it, things start to happen pretty quickly. And uh, the world starts to look very different than it did before. Yeah, I think one of the videos that you had out um, where you talked about how you anticipated this in, in that for the Fed to taper to a point at which the economy, you know, uh, starts, you know, you know, feeling some pain and then they react politically to solve that pain. And then that just, you know, really collapses the, the system to, to some degree. I don't know. Uh, exactly how bad you anticipate that collapse, but nonetheless, um, certainly a, you know, a pretty good size of loss in equities uh, is what I think you're anticipating, right? Yeah, so the, uh, right now, um, we're, I, I would be shocked if we don't see them finish their uh, asset purchases in March. And if we don't see at least one rate hike out of them, and I also anticipate to see their balance sheet start to go down. And yeah. it's like almost nobody thinks that they'll be able to make it that far. Um, they think that the Fed has just been, you know, lying this whole time, basically, and saying they're going to do it, but not actually going to do it. Uh, the only thing that will prevent them from going through with that is if we see a GSIB fall over, which a GSIB is a globally systemically important bank. Um, if we see a GSIB fall over, you know, suddenly overnight, say, you know, I'm insolvent, I need a bailout. Um, or if we see, uh, you know, an emerging markets crisis, if we see um, a big corporation, you know, start to fall over that could have, uh, you know, knock on effect. They're not right now, at least maybe th this hasn't always been true, but right now they don't care about the stock market. It could go down 20% from here. They're not looking at the stock market right now. The only time that they would care about the stock market going down is if it impacts the uh, balance sheets of the, uh, of the companies to the point where they uh, start to become insolvent. They can't uh, 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 make the, their debt service payments, which is possible. Highly over leveraged, most over leveraged uh, uh, economy in history. So it's possible, but uh, in terms of just strictly the stock price, they could care less. And so I think we'll see that. And um, I think we'll see the tightening. I think we'll see the balance sheet start to decline. I think we'll see the rates start to go up. And at some point, probably this year, uh, we're going to see we're going to see one of those crises unfold. We're going to see somebody become insolvent. And then the Federal Reserve at that point will have to reverse course. They'll have to add to their balance sheet trillions. They'll have to drop rates to zero all across the, the yield curve. They'll have to maybe buy stocks, they'll have to step in and everything that they did in March, 2020, uh, they'll do all that plus more in order to deal with the uh, deal with the crash. 
And I think on the back of that, the one to two years following that is when we would see hyperinflation. We're not going to see hyperinflation right now. Okay. And so that's what triggers the hyperinflation is their rescue plan. Mm -hmm. So do you think the Chinese uh, real estate bubble that you hear about, of course, who knows what the information you hear um, is accurate, but it, you know, it appears that there's some sort of a real estate bubble in China. Do you think that could be a catalyst to spin some of these dominoes down? Or do you think that doesn't affect the global market that much? Initially, I thought it could get that way, but um, given the time that's uh, gone by since the Evergrande situation mm-hmm. started to unfold and now and seeing how it's rolled its way through the economy, it's it's hurting individual Chinese citizens, um, but it's it has not yet and doesn't look like it will present the type of risk that could uh, start a domino effect. And part of the reason for that is the way that China has now just recently within the last like week or so start to respond. And because the, uh, the United States is tightening, now China is uh, easing. And they were tightening when we were easing, you know, throughout 2020 and 2021. And so um, they're uh, trying to deal with the, their crash by um, lowering rates. And they just gave their um, central bank, the um, uh, People's Bank of China, PBOC, um, kind of more, a lot more autonomy. Uh, recently to deal with the uh, economy. And so they're, they're uh, d- getting using that autonomy to ease more um, and potentially even devalue the yuan a little bit, um, which could uh, boost their exports. So I think we, it's possible we might be seeing the, uh, uh, the worst of it already done in China. And um, a lot of these Chinese stocks have you know, crashed a lot and, and they might be right now goodbyes. Not, not advice, but uh, it's, it's, it's just a possibility. Right. So, um, and how do you see any of these, uh, you know, possible, uh, I, I'll use the term war, but I don't, I don't anticipate any of them becoming full-scale wars, but Ukraine, Taiwan, any of these things, how do you see those things really um, affecting, say, the U.S. economy, for instance? They would yeah. fire up. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think there's always a possibility that uh, um, that that America tries to find itself engaged in another war that it doesn't uh, uh, it doesn't have to be involved in, unfortunately. And the reason I say that is because that's you know we've got a long history of doing that, um, uh, intentionally getting ourselves involved in wars that uh, we didn't need to get involved in, um, many of them of our own making, um, and so. Uh, that's that's always a possibility that that happens. Uh, if I was placing a bet on it, my bet would be that tensions would die down and would not escalate. Um, I think the uh, the uh, yeah, I think ju- it just seems like everything you know right that's going on over there right now um, might be a little bit overblown by Western media. And um, the justification for uh, escalating militarily might not be there right now, um, especially with uh, with administration popularity and and things like that. So we'll see, though. Well, okay, Uh, Joe, man, this has been just incredibly informative and I really enjoyed meeting you. Um, Once again, you're going to be in Dallas on March the 5th. Uh, do you guys have a location yet, or is that still to be determined? Uh, still to be determined, and uh, that will show up. We'll, we'll, we're sending out email updates along the way, um, and um, the uh, uh, the page w- that uh, that uh, that I'll send you the link for will have it listed as well once we have it nailed down. All right. Well, great. Tell you what, I, I really enjoyed it. Is there any final thoughts for any of my? uh folks that you may want to pass on or no not at all i really appreciate you having me on and uh um uh, we had a i had a fun discussion here and uh hopefully uh we get the word out and more people learn about how the system works and uh, the world will be a better place all right man well hey i really appreciate it and um if there's any ever anything i can do to uh help you out or if you need anything feel free to reach out to me i really appreciate you taking the time and and uh, let me talk to you and pick your brain for a lot of this stuff. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.